Back before everyone got all their news for free on the internet, people bought newspapers, and those newspapers were typically sold by kids called newsboys or newsies. But at the end of the 19th century, two of the wealthiest media tycoons in the country tried to fatten their wallets by unfairly cutting into the newsies' already meager earnings, which led to the newsboy strike of 1899. You might know it as the subject of the Disney musical Newsy, starring the pre-Batman voice of Christian Bale. Using a combination of public relations know-how and cunning strategy, the ragamuffin Newsies outsmarted the tycoons and brought their empires crumbling down in just two weeks, forcing them to rethink their wage-swiping practices. Before we get going, make sure to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel. It'll make you feel good. Real good. Okay, great. Here's what happened. Newsies had to buy all the newspapers they sold directly from the publishers at wholesale, and then try to sell them on street corners for a profit. But during the Spanish-American War in 1898, a war heavily rumored to have been engineered by William Randolph Hearst specifically to sell newspapers, publishers raised the price of a bundle of newspapers to a then astronomical 60 cents. In 1899, most publishers, with the exception of Hearst, lowered the price of a bundle down to 50 cents. But that still meant Newsies were only earning an average of 26 cents a day, roughly eight dollars in today's money. That's barely enough for a McDonald's extra value meal. By the summer of 1899, the Newsies had had enough and decided to strike, although presumably with less singing and dancing than in the Disney movie. The strike began when Newsies learned that a delivery man for one of the major newspapers was shorting their bundles, effectively stealing money from them on behalf of the publisher. So the Newsies flipped his wagon like a bunch of soccer hooligans and stole all of his newspapers. The pillaging of the newspaper carriage led to the formation of the Manhattan Newsboys Union and a larger strike that demanded that publishers lower the prices of their newspaper bundles. To avoid getting broken up by the cops, the Newsies showed their moxie by planning their strike to coincide with the Brooklyn streetcar driver's strike, which was occupying most of the police's attention. Back then, the newspaper industry depended on the criminally underpaid Newsies to distribute its papers, so when the Newsies went on strike, the effect was immediate. The New York World, one of the biggest papers at the time, saw its distribution drop by nearly two-thirds. The editor of the World said, Practically all the boys in New York have quit selling. The advertisers have abandoned the papers. It's really remarkable the success these boys have had. We imagine he issued this compliment through extremely gritted teeth. In the midst of the strike, the Newsies organized a rally at Irving Hall to get the public on their side with a rousing speech by their de facto leader, Kid Blink, which is one of the coolest names of New York at the time, or even now. Referring to the publishing tycoon's exploitive bundle prices, Kid Blink said during the rally, I'm trying to figure out how 10 cents on 100 papers can be more to a millionaire than it does to newsboys. I just can't see it. For a group of 5,000 kids aged 7 to 12, the Newsies were an impressively well-organized labor union. They met to establish their demands and also to identify vulnerable targets, specifically newspaper distribution points. The strikers descended on Newspaper Row like an underpaid hurricane, pelting delivery men with fruit, ransacking their carriages, and destroying their newspapers. Tactics like this devastated the distribution of tyrannical publications like the New York World. As you might expect for any child labor force, the life of a newsboy wasn't easy. Before the strike, newsies would buy bundles of 100 newspapers for 50 cents and sell each paper for a penny apiece, meaning they had to sell half their stock just to afford to work the next day. Newsies would routinely work long, late hours and sell as many papers as they could, because by the time the next morning rolled around, a new edition would be out, and yesterday's stock would be worthless. Some children would still be out on the street desperately hawking papers at one in the morning, which is well past when most people care to receive news. And shouldn't they be in bed? Nothing moves newspapers like international conflict, and the Spanish-American War was no exception. When the war broke out in 1898, publishing tycoons William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer saw their sales skyrocket, due in no small part to both men's habit of sensationalizing or straight-up inventing stories surrounding the conflict. And like most wealthy people in history, Hearst and Pulitzer had no desire to pass on their good fortune to their workforce. Rather than increase wages for the already destitute newsies, they raised the price of their newspaper bundles, cutting into the newsboys' meager wages to maximize their profits. Now that's asking for some carriage flipping. 
You already know that a primary tactic of the striking newsies was to attack delivery carriages and steal or destroy the cargo of newspapers to prevent strike-busting scabs from selling them, but that wasn't the only trick up their dusty little sleeves. The newsboys would routinely target newsstand owners who refused to support their strike and drench them with buckets of water. Unless the owner was a woman, because according to Kid Blink, A feller don't soak a lady. In addition to refusing to sell their papers and actively disrupting their distribution, the Newsies directly addressed both advertisers and the public and urged them not to support Hearst or Pulitzer's publications, the New York Journal and the New York World. The Newsboys Union delivered a resolution that stated, If you have any sympathy with us, help us to boycott these papers by not reading them. Take out your advertisements as no one sells these papers. No one will be able to read them. Instead, the Newsies steered their supporters toward rival publications like The Evening Sun, The Telegram, and The Daily News, which were charging fairer rates for their bundles. Fairer rates for a child labor force in 1899 still weren't great, but at least they were better than what Hearst and Pulitzer were offering. To give you an idea of what the Newsies were up against, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer weren't just the big fish in the pond of New York City. They were the two wealthiest media moguls in the nation, constantly battling for the top spot like Scrooge McDuck and Flintheart Glomgold. But Hearst and Pulitzer dramatically underestimated how much their empires depended on the newsboys. Home delivery hadn't been invented yet, and there weren't nearly enough newsstands to cover their millions of readers. So when the newsies refused to sell their papers, Hearst and Pulitzer couldn't ignore them. Once both tycoons realized how much power the newsies held, they finally agreed to sit down and negotiate an end to the strike. The strike dragged on from July to August of 1899 until Hearst and Pulitzer decided their wallets had taken enough of a beating and were willing to work with the boys. Originally, the Newsboys Union had only been asking Hearst and Pulitzer to lower the price of their wholesale bundles back down to 50 cents. But in a stunning gesture of near humanity, the tycoons agreed to an even larger demand. In addition to lowering their wholesale prices, the Journal and the World would buy back any unsold newspapers from the Newsies for a full refund, protecting the boys against losses and guaranteeing they never had to work past midnight just to break even. Despite most of their members barely being two digits in age and having a colorful leadership made up of kids named Kid Blank, Young Mush, Crutchy Morris, and Racetrack Higgins, the Newsboys Union managed to beat two of the most powerful men in America in a matter of weeks. How'd they pull that off? It was a combination of insider knowledge, strategic planning, and plain old business savvy. The boys launched their strike in the middle of the seemingly more important streetcar driver strike, which kept the coppers out of their hair. They knew the weak point in both Hearst's and Pulitzer's profits was distribution, so they attacked and looted delivery carriages like a band of Dickensian orphans. But they also understood the importance of public opinion, appealing directly to their millions of customers and urging them to buy rival newspapers. Those papers, in turn, wrote glowing pieces about the boys and their strike, which further rallied people to their cause, driving advertisers away from Hearst and Pulitzer. It's a tactic we see used effectively to this day. The Newsboys' strike brought national attention to the heartbreaking reality of child workers in America. Several boys featured in articles about the strike were homeless and would put themselves in danger on a daily basis to try and earn their meager living, hopping onto trolley cars to cover more ground and staying out on the street alone until well past midnight. Less than a decade after the Newsboys' strike gained national attention, the National Child Labor Committee began a serious effort to abolish child labor, which included collecting photographs of newsies and other children working in poverty and in unsafe conditions. The minimum working age was raised shortly after, ending child labor in America. Not bad for a bunch of newsies who went to war with two millionaires over a dime. It's not often that the most powerful men in the country get outfoxed by a scrappy gang of kids, but that's exactly what happened during the Newsboys strike in the summer of 1899. What did you think about the newsies? Leave us a comment and check these other fine videos of our weird history. Oh, and subscribe. Subscribe.